Hi, this is Pastor Chris from River Rock Church, and I want to talk to you about victory over guilt. Victory over guilt. So I read a story about a guy who went to a restaurant, and he ordered his meal and a Coke. He got the Coke, and uh, the waiter came back to check and see how things were, and the guy took his Coke, threw it in the waiter's face. And the waiter's like, what was that for? And the guy's like, I'm really sorry, I've got this Coke. Compulsion, this inner compulsion. I just can't help it. I, I, I'm really sorry. I won't do it again. Um, I'm really sorry. Um, could you bring me another Coke? And the waiter's like, okay. So um, waiter comes back with another Coke. Guy looks at the Coke, looks at the waiter, throws it in the waiter's face again. And the waiter's like, come on, seriously, what's wrong with you? He's like, I've got this compulsion. It's, I just, it's hard for me not to act on. I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I really do need help. I'm so sorry that, that I did that. Um, I'm going to go get help. So the guy went to a psychotherapy clinic and got counseling, got help, um, was gone for a while. Like two months later, he shows up at the restaurant again. Waiter's like, oh, great. This guy's back. And the guy is like, hey, how you doing? Uh, really sorry about what happened in the past. Um, um, I went to uh, the clinic. I got help. I got counseling. Um, we worked it out. Um, um, I'm really sorry. I'd like to order this. And could you bring me a Coke? And so the waiter's like, um, last time you came here and you had me bring you Coke, I had to change my shirt. The guy's like, I am so, so sorry that won't happen again. So anyway, so the waiter brings him his food, brings him a Coke. Guy looks at the Coke, looks at the waiter, looks at the Coke, looks at the waiter, throws it in the waiter's face again. And the waiter's like, come on, I thought you got help for this. I thought that you got therapy. I thought you said you were cured. And the guy's like, well, yeah, I did get help. I am cured. I can't stop the inner compulsion, but I don't feel guilty anymore. That is not the kind of guilt that I want to help you with today. I don't want to help you feel better about your guilt and keep doing things that don't honor God or keep doing things that cause pain or difficulty. I want to help you to find victory over guilt through Jesus. Victory over guilt is what we're going to talk about today. The Bible is full of stories of people that suffered with guilt and fear because of their guilt. So you remember Jacob and Esau. Uh, Jacob stole Esau's blessing, fled town, went to live with Uncle Laban for a while. Eventually, he wants to come back home. He's got all of his possessions and everything. But the one thing that he feels guilty about, the one thing that he fears, is his brother Esau. So here in Genesis 32, verse 4, it says, um, Jacob tells his servants, uh, Give this message to Esau. Humble greetings from your servant Jacob. Until now, I've been living with Uncle Laban, and now I own cattle, donkeys, flocks of sheep, and goats, and many servants. I have sent these messengers to inform you of my coming, hoping that you will be friendly to me. So he's got this fear. He's got this guilt that comes with fear that somebody's going to remember what he did, that somebody's going to take vengeance, that Esau's going to uh, get even. And a lot of times we go through life with that same kind of fear. Uh, it says, after delivering the message, the messengers returned to Jacob and reported, Hey, we met your brother Esau, and he's already on his way to meet you. With an army of 400 men, Jacob was terrified at the news. He divided his household, along with the flocks and herds and camels, into, into two groups. And it talks about how he had stages of his possessions and the stuff going through, hoping that uh, his brother Esau wasn't going to cause trouble. Turned out that he didn't, and that he was fearing something that wasn't going to happen. But we suffer with guilt like that, too. We are afraid of somebody's going to remember what happened, you know, 10 years ago, and they're going to bring it up. Or that everybody knows uh, about that stupid thing that we did, or something like that guilt. You know, Zacchaeus wanted to follow after Jesus, but the people in his town didn't think that he was worthy because he was a tax collector and everybody hated tax collectors. And in Luke 19, when it talks about um, Jesus and Zacchaeus and how Jesus' priority is to seek and to save those who are lost, it says, when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. He said, Zacchaeus, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and the tree and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I've cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. 
So Zacchaeus had his guilt, but he dealt with it. He was willing to repent and make amends and make things right. And we should do that too, if there's anything in our lives. Uh, sometimes we can mess up our lives in just a moment, uh, in just a poor decision. The words that we say, Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, closest friends, denied Jesus, just like Jesus said he would. And in Matthew 26, 75, we hear, Suddenly Jesus' words flash through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. And then Peter went away weeping bitterly because he fell into that sin, because he fell into that temptation, because he made that wrong choice. And he was full of guilt, but Jesus restored him. So what do we do with guilt? A lot of people drown their guilt, their sorrows with alcohol, drugs, overeating. Uh, millions are in 12-step programs trying to undo uh, the addictions they found themselves in. And maybe they started those addictions to try to bring themselves, uh, self-medicate, try to bring themselves happiness or peace. Or um, anyway, uh, people often drown their pain, their sorrows, their guilt. Often people deal with guilt by denying it. And saying, well, you know, I guess I shouldn't feel guilty about that because, you know, it is 2020 and we should be able to do whatever we want, however we want it. And I shouldn't let something old fashioned like the Bible tell me what I can, can and cannot do. And uh, we deny, they deny the authority of God's word. Uh, they refuse to let God guilt them. Others deflected and blame others, blame their parents, blame the school, blame uh, society, blame their work, blame their boss. It's always somebody else's fault. And so uh, they uh, try to push guilt off by blaming someone other. It's not my fault. So, but if guilt is a tough stain, only Jesus can get guilt stains out. Jesus can get those guilt stains out. You know, all of us have things that we regret, things that we would give anything to undo. Uh, some of those things might have been mistakes. Uh, some of those things might have been things that we did that we know we shouldn't have done. And we feel guilty about all of those things. Uh, many people are burdened by guilt. Many people suffer from the guilt of the things that they've done, the things of the past. They carry a heavy burden of guilt. And we need to try to break free of that. Uh, the best thing we can do is to confess it to the Lord and, again, see if we can make things right. So King David was... A uh, man of God after God's own heart. Uh, God was using him, king of Israel, um, doing all these things. Um, but he had a bad night. And he gave into temptation with a woman, Bathsheba. And then uh, she went home. And a while later, she comes back and she says, um, I'm pregnant. And David's like, oh, no, that's not good because you're married and your husband is away. So how are we going to explain that one? So he's like, I know, we'll get your husband to come home. We'll let him go home, and then we'll say it's his baby. And so anyway, Uzziah comes home. He doesn't go home, though. He stays at the, at the palace on the steps. He's like, it's not right for me to go home while everybody else is fighting the battle. Um, so then David's like, great, now what are we going to do? What a mess. Seriously, you're going to be loyal on any time like this? You need to listen to me and go home. So anyway, David's like, great, this is a mess. So um, here's what we'll do is we will send, have Uzziah go to the front lines of the battle. And when uh, fighting is really intense, have everybody else pull back, basically uh, arranging for his death. So then David's an adulterer, David's a murderer. And then uh, he goes on for a period of time, not confessing this, just kind of going on with life until Nathan the prophet comes along, tells him the story about uh, this guy that's only got one little baby lamb and a guy with a bunch of lambs comes and seals it. And um, so David's all upset. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, that, guy, that man should be. Anyway, and then Nathan the prophet's like, dude, that man is you. That is what you did. And then David repented. And we read about that in Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. Uh, in Psalm 38, David writes, my guilt overwhelms me. It is a burden too heavy to bear. Maybe you are burdened by guilt. Maybe you are carrying a burden too heavy to bear. And Jesus can help you with that. Um, stick with me uh, and we'll talk about that. But in Psalm 32, 1, Psalm 32, verse 1, uh, David writes, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. And you and I need to be experiencing that joy. We need to know that God loves us. God can forgive any sin, no matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, that God can offer forgiveness. He doesn't often take, he doesn't always take the penalty away. Uh, you know, law, uh, courts, all that stuff. You might have to endure that, but God can forgive you. 
and help you in this life to experience that forgiveness. So <clears throat> number one, um, conviction. We need conviction. But conviction comes from the spirit or the enemy. So number one, conviction from the spirit or the enemy. Our enemy is Satan. The Holy Spirit wants to help us change our behavior, change our life so we can do the things that God wants us to do and experience blessing and not be having so many experiences in our life that cause guilt and sadness and hurt other people. So you and I need to confess that. David writes in Psalm 32 verse 3, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. So unconfessed sin can cause a real mess. Unconfessed sin is a real burden. Unconfessed sin can make you depressed and sad and lead to so many sad things. But uh, Satan tries to um, take that and twist it and turn it into uh, a guilt, a uh, feeling of unworthiness, a feeling that uh, because we've sinned, that we're no longer worthy to follow God, that he's not going to forgive that one, that he's not going to want anything to do with us. But David understood that even though he sinned, he could come back into the Lord's presence. So in Psalm 51, David prays, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. So he realized that he had made a mess, that he had stained his life with sin, and he was asking the Lord to cleanse him, to uh, forgive him, to help him. So he was taking responsibility, and you and I need to take responsibility. Then he continued to pray, Wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. So when we feel dirty, when we feel uh, weighed down with sin, we need to ask ourselves, okay, is it the Holy Spirit trying to get me to confess that sin, to repent, to turn and do right? Or is it Satan trying to accuse me and pull me down and destroy me and pull me away from God? So the Holy Spirit has been sent to teach us how to live. The Holy Spirit has been sent to help us to live the Christian life, to empower us for service, to give us gifts for ministry. Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit before he came to earth. So Jesus knows the Holy Spirit's going to come, and this is what Jesus says the Holy Spirit's going to do. He will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. So God can use guilt, actually, to help unsaved people realize their need to be saved, to use guilt to help convict them of sin so that they will have a desire to turn to Jesus, to confess their sin and to be saved. And the Holy Spirit brings that conviction. So um, when the Holy Spirit comes on us and convicts us of sin, we should confess that right away. Uh, even through prayer of praying like something like, uh, uh, Lord, I realize that I did this wrong thing. I realize that it's sin and it's wrong and I shouldn't have done it. Please forgive me and help me not to do it again. That's a great prayer for a Christ follower. So number two, condemnation can be paralyzing. So let's get back to this. Uh, my guilt overwhelms me. It's a burden too heavy to bear in Psalm 38, 4. Um, so the guilt, the feeling of guilt, the feeling of being overwhelmed by sadness and conviction, the devil can use that to destroy us. Without Christ, the Bible says that we're children of the devil. You know, in John 8, 44, Jesus says, You are children of your father, the devil. You love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he lies, it's consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You know, there's a lot of people that <clears throat> aren't saved, that don't know Christ, that don't really think anything of doing wrong. They don't really think anything is sinful. Uh, they don't know. Um, you would think that they know, but sometimes their conscience is seared. They've been told that it doesn't matter. One reason why they act like it's okay when it's not okay is because Satan, the Bible says that Satan disguises himself like an angel of light. So sometimes uh, he seems to be like a, a Christian um, philosopher or pastor or uh, counselor or whatever saying it doesn't matter that's not really sin and uh, so Second uh, Corinthians eleven fourteen says but I'm not surprised even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light so sometimes uh, we're getting bad teaching from um, not somebody who's godly but somebody who is godless 
So Revelation 12.10 says that Satan is the accuser of our brothers. Uh, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. So here we have Satan accusing uh, people, accusing you and I when we fall into sin before God. But when we have believed and we have our faith placed in Jesus Christ, uh, we can rely on Jesus uh, blood and righteousness is imputed righteousness given to us so that that accusation won't stick. And we're told in 1 Peter 5, 8, to be careful, to stay alert. Watch out your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, looking to trip us up into, into temptation, looking to get us to have an experience that will lead to great sadness great guilt and push us away from God to discredit us, to discredit our ministry, to try to get us to quit serving and following Jesus. Stay alert. Watch out. He wants to bring us down and fill our lives with guilt and pain and heartache. But number three, confession can set us free. Number three, confession can set us free. Psalm 51.3, David Praise for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. And against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So David is praying. He's confessing his sin. He's confessing his condition before the Lord. Of course, the Lord knows our hearts and our minds and everything about it. But it is therapeutic for us to confess it to the Lord. It is helpful for us to confess that sin before the Lord. Um, we can do it silently or we can do it out loud or we can write it down or that uh, your sin has been covered. Your sin has been taken care of because you are in Jesus. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So that confessing our sin. So, you know, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Obey my commandments. What does Jesus want us to do? Well, Jesus wants lost people to get saved. Jesus wants us to follow after him and to live for him. Um, Jesus wants us to accomplish his purposes in life. Um, for a believer in Christ, uh, one thing that Jesus wants us to do is to be baptized. So Jesus was baptized as a believer. He came to John the Baptist, and uh, John the Baptist is like, oh, well, you should baptize me. And Jesus is like, no, do this to fulfill our righteousness. And Jesus said that we're supposed to be baptizing people and teaching people to obey everything as we make disciples. So therefore, if you want to be a sold-out follower of Jesus and you've already been saved, uh, you should be baptized as a believer. So, um, 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, The kind of sorrow that God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. So, it's a godly sorrow. It's uh, coming before the Lord and confessing your sin. If you just feel bad about it, but the Lord's got nothing to do with your process, then it doesn't work to help you to get into a right spiritual condition. We need to ask God to cleanse us from sin. We need to ask God to forgive us of sin. We need to follow after the Lord. And as we are confessing our sin, as we're learning God's word, then we'll want to do the things that God wants us to do. In Psalm 51, 7, David prays, Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You've broken me. Now let me rejoice. David prays that. David wants to be cleansed. David wants to be washed whiter than snow because Jesus gets guilt stains out. So number four, conversion can save us. Conversion can save us. I've been talking about uh, being saved. I've been talking about following Jesus. Well, what are we saved from? We're saved from the penalty of our sins. Uh, when we are saved, when we get into a right relationship with Jesus, we're no longer a child of the devil, but we are a child of God. We receive the Holy Spirit to help us live the Christian life. And we can do that by uh, Romans 10, 9. says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, you know, John three sixteen says, this is how, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And we all know that verse. 
Uh, maybe we've said it a different way, like, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. But it's the same. It's just a different Bible version. It's the version. It's the same message. But nonetheless, so God loved us and he gave Jesus. If we believe in him, believe upon him, we won't perish but have eternal life. But it says in John 3, 36, that anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Yea, I believe in God's Son, and I have eternal life. But it says anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. So we want to do what Jesus wants us to do. We want to follow Jesus. We want to place our faith in Him and follow Him and be saved. And a great way to do that, a great way to enter into that relationship that was in Romans 10, uh, 13, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved is by praying. Praying is talking to God and praying something like, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my life and save me. I acknowledge that you died on the cross and rose again. Please come into my life and make me the person you created me to be. I want to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. And a prayer like that, the prayer doesn't save you, but the heart attitude, desire, the talking to God and asking to be saved and coming into that right relationship can totally transform and change your life. Psalm 112, verse 1. Praise the Lord. How joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. And then uh, in Psalm 51, 12, David prays, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to to obey you. So to be saved isn't just fire insurance. It is a new way of life. It's a new way of living. It's trying to avoid future sin, trying to avoid future failure, trying to follow after uh, Jesus the way that he wants us to. And you and I have all these great opportunities to serve and great opportunities to uh, make choices on how we're going to live our life. And when we make right choices, when we make right choices that honor God, when we say no to temptation and yes to God, it glorifies God. And that is so awesome. You know, sometimes we struggle with the false guilt where um, we feel guilty about things we really don't have control over. Uh, Satan can actually use that to push us down and push us away from God. So we really need to think about the things we feel guilty about and ask ourselves, okay, is this something that I've done or something that I can fix or is it? Uh, some guilt that I've assumed for something that I haven't done. Um, you know, uh, we could say something like, uh, knowing that God always loves me allows me to be more loving and forgiving of others. Um, you know, if we're guilty of something and we acknowledge that, you know, and say, you know, God loves me and I'm not perfect, um, but he forgives me. Therefore, I know a lot of people that aren't perfect and I should forgive them. Or you could say, God could never love me. If I let others get too close and see what I'm really like, they'll reject me. I can't count on any, anyone but myself. Then that type of um, false guilt, that type of uh, attitude might cause us to push everybody away and cause us to uh, not be very effective serving the Lord. There's bad theology in that statement. I read a story of a guy that... Um, in Pennsylvania that was sitting on a parking ticket from 44 years ago. Felt real bad about it, so he sent uh, uh, a letter to the post office. He, uh, on the return address, the return address says, Feeling Guilty, Wayward Road, Anytown, California. So basically it was a $2 ticket uh, back in the mid-70s, so he put in $5 to cover the interest. And the police, uh, you know, they can't really track it and trace it uh, try to figure out whose ticket it was, but there was a note on the inside. The police chief said there was a note on the inside that says, Dear PD, I've been carrying this ticket around for 40 plus years. I was intending to pay. Forgive me if I don't give you my info. With respect, Dave. You know, there's a lot of people that are carrying around guilt that wish they could find some way to make it right. I guess Dave figured out a way to uh, feel better about the ticket that he had been carrying around all of those years. So I hear it's a $20 ticket nowadays. But anyway, at number five, confidence comes from when we know we are forgiven. When we know we're forgiven, it changes the way that we live. When we know we are forgiven, it changes the way we act, the way we carry ourselves, the way we approach God. So Psalm 103 talks about how the God of the universe who knows everything and can remember everything chooses to forget our sin when we are in Jesus 
It says, He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. That's a long ways. A long ways that he has chosen to forget our sin, to remove our sin and not remember them anymore. You know, um, sometimes when people ask to be forgiven, we need to forgive them and then not bring it up anymore in the future. We need to be like God is to us and forgive and forget. So Romans 8 1 says, There is now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Do you belong to Christ Jesus? Have you prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you following him? If so, uh, you are forgiven and there's no condemnation for those who belong to to Christ Jesus. Matter of fact, uh, when we have confidence before the Lord, we're much more likely to approach his throne. We're much more likely to come to him in times of trouble. We're much more likely to want to spend time with him. Hebrews 10, 22. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. So when we're following after the Lord, when we're doing the things that he wants us to do, when we're uh, living in a righteous way, then our actions will show that we belong to Jesus. First John three nineteen. our actions will show that we belong to the truth. So we will be confident when we stand before God. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings and he knows everything. To have a confidence when you stand before God. You know, that's one thing that we at River Rock Church would like to do is to help everybody to make sure that they are going to heaven to make sure that uh, no one in Belle Plaine, Jordan, Henderson, the surrounding area uh, is going to slip into hell because they didn't hear about Jesus. And then to be able to stand before the Lord on Judgment Day or uh, when we die and go to be with Jesus, uh, to stand before them with great confidence and, and assurance because we know whom we have believed, because we followed Jesus, because uh, we were secure in our faith, that it won't be an introduction, it will be a family reunion. And number six, my last point, very short point, I promise. Compassion is showed and shown. Showed and shown. Compassion. So the Lord shows us compassion. We need to show compassion to others. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. So, God shows us compassion. We need to show others compassion. God comforts us. We need to comfort others. We need to help comfort those in trouble and difficulty and tell them our story. Tell them our faith story. Tell them how Jesus has helped us through the greatest, darkest times. We can do um, so many things through Christ. So next week, we're going to talk about victory over anger. Now I'd like to talk to you about something else real quick. 19 years ago today, my family and I, we moved to Belle Plaine. We had no contacts, didn't know anybody in town that wanted to start a church. We just showed up and went on a prayerful scavenger hunt to find people to be part of the church. We had home Bible studies and we were trying to raise up the core group so we could start up a church. So we showed up in October, had the Bible studies in October, November, and then in December said, hey, let's have a Christmas party at the elementary school and then said, hey, um, let's meet here for church. Uh, January 2002 we had like private gatherings or they're supposed to be private but people showed up anyway then we had our big kickoff service on Palm Sunday and uh, over 300 people came and um, so we've been a church ever since we are an officially accredited church August uh, in 2002 and we've been uh, pressing on serving Jesus the best we have we've been able to um, it hasn't been easy uh, there's been some great exciting victories and disappointments uh, one disappointment is we've never been able to get our own building so at one point we owed 20 acres of land and we owed a lot of money on it. We were able to sell 10 acres of land and, and we owed little money on it, but we've almost got it paid off. We've got 10 acres of land on the highway, but we haven't been able to build because it's super expensive. And when I've tried to get help from our denomination to build, I was told that our priority is people, not buildings. If you can get a building, great, but um, the priority is people. And then I was handed a book called When Not to Build and it had this list of all these times that you shouldn't build the church like when your church doesn't have enough money coming in when uh, yeah so anyway 
Not as I was looking at that book, looking for the perfect time, and I was told that there'll never be a time when a church won't have a place to meet. You can always find a place to rent. Well, it turns out that that is not true. So um, in March, we were kicked out of the school because of COVID, and then uh, we're not let back in. The school's like, well, we, we probably won't let you get back in. There's no time that we can think of that you will be able to meet here again. We're keeping the outsiders out. So um, we have uh, called some other churches and said, hey, can we share your space? Can we rent some space? And uh, one pastor was like, oh, that sounds great. And then he checked with the congregation and stuff, and they're like, oh, no, they might bring us COVID. So can't meet there. So this is actually the first Sunday um, since like 2002. We haven't had a place to meet. Uh, we've been meeting outside of the parking lot, but uh, cold this Sunday morning. And uh, so we're back online. But we have this opportunity to get a building, a uh, 6,000 square foot building. And uh, what we'd like to do is sell our land and take that money to buy the building. But uh, until that time, if we were to take out a loan, we don't have enough money coming in. Uh, COVID has hurt our finances and our attendance. But we don't want to give up on this dream of River Rock Church. We don't want to give up on this desire to have a building and use that to glorify God. And I'm pretty confident that if we have this building that we can social distance and good ventilation and make it possible for um, people to feel comfortable bringing their families there. But the thing is, is that we need more resources. A lot of times we send church planters out or missionaries out and we support them financially for a while. And so at prayer meeting today, I was talking about this and thinking about this. And um, so if you're a friend of River Rock or have family that go here or care about our church or the community, would you consider uh, maybe for like six months or so um, helping support us for just a bit? Uh, maybe uh, $50 a month or $100 a month or $500 a month to give us the funds that we need so that we can rent a space or afford the payment on the loan to buy the space. Uh, and if you know somebody that invests in real estate or uh, would like to build something right on Highway 169 on 10 acres of land that has a water main on two sides of the property, uh, it's a great investment. Just think, you could invest in something for the future in a piece of land and help build the kingdom of God today and help out uh, River Rock Church. So <clears throat> anyway, River Rock Church is uh, um, been around for almost 20 years, 19 years right now. I'd love to love to just keep pushing on and keep serving. I'd love to see 20 years and celebrating that. Um, one interesting thing, when I first came to town, uh, the only people I've met when we were looking at buying the house were my neighbors on both sides of me, and uh, they had babies. So, um, baby boys. And what's really cool is that those baby boys are all growing up. And uh, so, uh, one of them, on one side is going to Crown College, and one on the other side is going to the University of Northwestern. So they both grew up at River Rock, and they're going to Christian colleges, and I just think that's so awesome. So, anyway, <clears throat> you can um, give to um, help us, or give to support River Rock Church to keep us going at riverrockchurch.com slash give. And on the screen, there is a graphic that shows like five ways to give. You can mail the P.O. Box 184, uh, River Rock, uh, you can mail the P.O. Box 184, Bell Plain, Minnesota, 56011. Uh, you can go to riverrockchurch.com slash give. Uh, please pray that we find a place to meet and we don't become a COVID casualty. I'd read somewhere that up to 20% of churches won't survive COVID, and I'm hoping that we will be one of the ones that uh, survives COVID. So how can we pray for you? Share your prayer requests and praises at riverrockchurch.com slash pray. If you'd like to hear past messages, go to riverrockchurch.com slash listen. You can see all the different ways to listen to the audio. Uh, you can watch uh, prayer messages at riverrockchurch.com slash watch. And we have a few resources actually linked on that site, like children's bulletins for today and things like that. Uh, we aren't meeting as a large group, as a church, because we haven't found a place uh, currently, right now, um, where we can meet today that fits us with social distancing and um, all the COVID requirements. But we are meeting for life groups. <clears throat> But we are meeting for life groups. So we've got a men's group on Tuesdays, a women's group on Saturdays, a prayer group on Saturday, a youth group on um, Wednesday. Actually, there's another Zoom youth group on Monday that they've been doing. And then um, uh, Bible quizzing, uh, stuff like that. So look on our website, find out about that. But anyway, so um, 
I'm done. But I just thank you for uh, taking time today. I uh, thank you for praying. And um, I hope that if you are struggling with guilt, and it's much more than just praying it through, that you might find a Christian counselor to help you, or a pastor to uh, help you. Most pastors I know will um, listen, but if it seems real in depth. They usually refer you to a Christian counselor to work that out. A lot of times your insurance pays for that Christian counselor too, so that's a good thing. So we have resources for you on that. If you prayed to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, let us know so we can send you some resources to help you grow in the Christian faith. Or if you live far away, we could send you links that you could go to online. Let me pray again. Lord, I just thank you so much for people who have listened to this point. I pray that you would bless them in every way as they seek to follow you for all the mistakes that we make and for all the things that we do that cause people pain or uh, regret. Lord, we pray that you would help us to find forgiveness and release from our guilt. Lord, and for those people that have hurt us in the past, Lord, we pray that you would give us the ability to forgive them and to uh, walk uh, without the burdens of that guilt. Lord, I just thank you uh, for your grace, for your salvation, and for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. So with that, I am done. And this week's project is to figure out how to get rid of that shadow that's been bugging me the whole time on the wall. So, all right. Have a great week.